Today I'm joined by Taylor Morris. Taylor is Olympian 2018 and was a substitute in 2014. Welcome, Taylor. Thank you for having me, Christian. Taylor, I saw you got hooked with luge at the age of 11 when you watched the luge competition at the Salt Lake City Olympics. Why luge? Honestly, I just like to go fast. Um, at, at a young age, I've always pushed my boundaries of what's safe and uh, what, what I can do to maybe impress some other people, push my own boundaries if, if you want to go there. But I, I really like the aspect of how fast you would be going. Okay. And what partic do you remember anything in particular from these Olympics? Honestly, for, for 2002, because this is my home state uh, where the Olympics were, um, I didn't make it to any of, the, uh, any of the winter sports other than the Paralympic. Uh, it was the biathlon. My sister had won tickets to go up to it. And so I went with her and my brother and myself, and we watched the, the Paralympians do the biathlon. And that was really inspiring because there were some people with, you know, missing appendages, missing arms, missing legs. There was one individual who was completely blind. And it was just really uh, an inspirational moment for, for myself, knowing that I was trying to make the Olympics at some point in my life. Um, but for those around me who maybe weren't even looking to go to the Olympics, but it was just inspiring to watch. Yeah, I believe that. You are in the army in the world class athlete program. Uh, it's a program tailored specifically to athletes. Is that correct? That's correct. So you have to be in the army and you also have to reach a certain level. Every, every sport has a different level of where you have to reach. Um, but pretty much you have to be in a position as a soldier um, to compete at an Olympic Games or be pursuing the idea of working towards uh, an Olympic Games. So for me, working towards Luge, um, I joined back in 2011 in the Army, and um, I kind of knew that I was going to be put into the world-class athlete program. Um, just given my rank among uh, the national team, I was third overall at that point. So um, I knew that I wasn't going to have any issues getting into this world-class athlete program, but It's, uh, it's really a program in the Army that just allows you to be a soldier and an athlete at the same time. Um, and your Army obligations are a little bit different than, let's say, a normal soldier in the Army. Yeah, I know in Germany they have something very similar to that. that yeah, and same with Italy with, uh, with their police force. Yeah. yeah. And um, <laughs> which sports do they support? Uh, they support almost every sport, uh, to my knowledge. Um, The, the athletes that I know of from the winter side, there was bobsled, skeleton, uh, luge. And I don't think there was any more that had been in at least the U.S. Uh, that were in any, anything like that for the Army. Yeah, okay. And summer sports similar to that, right? Yeah, summer sports is a lot more, um, a lot more rigorous. I would say it's harder to do, mainly because the winter sports have a smaller selection of athletes in general uh, than the summer sports. So the summer sports, they, they have, you know, Taekwondo, they have boxing, they have wrestling, they have running. And the, the summer side is, is much fuller than the winter side in the American, uh, in the U S army. Yeah, okay. In your life as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? Oh, uh, My darkest moment, this is actually pretty easy for me, um, was not making the Olympics in 2014. Um, throughout the season, I had raced. I had my ups and downs. Um, but when it came to the pivotal moment was in Salt Lake City, um, we had a World Cup. And the way that our system works in USA Luge is there's a tier system. There's an A, a B, and a C tier. And given your racing uh, results throughout that, first half of the season, which runs from, you know, October until December, they, they choose the team off of the tiers that you make. And so without getting too deep into the details, um, I had pretty much secured a B tier, but needed to get an A tier. And the A tier would have been me placing 15th or better in this world cup uh, in Salt Lake city, which is my hometown. And, you know, for me, I had 
placed a, my first, so it's two runs for Luge, uh, unless you're at the Olympics. And my first run was really good. I was actually in, um, in 13th spot at that point. And I knew that all I needed to do was make it down the mountain, down the track, have a clean run. And I was, you know, pretty much golden, uh, to the slot in for that, that last spot. And for whatever reason, I, I don't, I don't know what it was, if it was fate or, um, you know, an act of God, so to say, but I just didn't have a very good second run. <laughs> and it was really hard to, to comprehend, um, you know, not as an athlete, but as just a spectator of how much time and effort and energy and sacrifice um, these athletes give up to pursue their dream as an Olympic athlete. And especially with the sport of luge, it, it takes a really long time to get good at it. You know, I started at 11 years old and didn't make the Olympics until I was 26. So um, it's not something that you can really cross train for. Um, but anyways, it was, it was a dark moment for me having a really bad second run. Cause I pretty much immediately knew that I wasn't going to make the Olympic team. And that was really tough to, to, to handle, you know, that's, that was 14 years or 13 and a half years at that point of hard work, dedication and sacrifice because I had messed up and, um, you know, really, it had really come down to four thousandths of a second with that, um, with the mistakes that I had made on the second run that cost me. So I actually ended up in 16th place and I didn't make my, my A tier. And I had to tell everybody, my friends, my family that I, I didn't make the Olympic team. And it's kind of a double-edged sword because you, you feel so bad for yourself, but at the same time, you feel like you've let so many other people down that have, that have had your back throughout this entire uh, journey. You know, ever since I was a young kid, my community had always supported me during fundraisers, during, um, you know, any other events that I was putting on and to show up empty handed was really, really difficult. Hmm. How did you recover from that moment? I recovery took a, took a long time. Um, yeah, you know, and it still hurts thinking about it, that I, I could be a two time Olympian that I had, I could have had another chance, um, at doing something great at the Olympics. And that, that chance was kind of, you know, sifted away from me, um, of my own doing, I can't blame anybody else, but recovery, it's, it's more so having to take a step back from the situation and look at, the entirety of the, um, you know, the situation that you're in and, and realize just how blessed you are. And I think coming from a background of being relatively religious and believing things happen for a reason that kind of helped a little bit, but, um, you know, I got married probably four, four and a half months after, um, after the, missing of the 2014 games and that, that pivotal race for me. Um, and having something to distract me a little bit from the like constant pain that I was in every morning and every night, uh, from missing the Olympics, but having my wife, um, girl fiance at the time and, you know, the community, my best friends, my family, my family, friends, my, my neighborhood, even, um, they were all just so supportive and they, they were all super, um, on the ball for trying to, get me picked back up again and saying, you know, you're okay. You can do it. Go for it again. Those kind of things really help when you have a community behind you. That's so supportive. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. You said you're religious and you think things happen for a reason. I mean, I can definitely follow the thought, but sometimes it's very difficult to believe things happen for a reason, right? How do you maintain? Yeah. Faith? <laughs> It's really difficult. And I, I won't say that I'm super religious. Um, you know, it's, it's more so my firm belief is things happen for a reason, but I also believe that things happen because of you and the things and the steps that I could have taken differently um, to, to prepare a little bit more maybe, or, um, you know, really, really focus on the race itself. It just, I think I was immature as an athlete at that point. Um, I hadn't really had something so, so difficult, a hurdle to get over. 
uh, so to speak, that this had, this this situation of me missing the 2014 games, uh, you know, really really made me a more mature person in general, but a very mature athlete in in a sense that I I've been through the struggle. I know what it's like to be so close and miss it that it lit a fire that I was going to do this again. I was going to give it another four years. I was going to dedicate absolutely everything with no distractions. Um, because the, the 2010 to 2014 quad, I was, I was 18 years old to 22, you know, and those are times in your life that you're trying to figure your own life out and figure your, who you are as a person and as an athlete um, when you're, when you're competing like the, the way we were. And so I think I learned a lot from the mistakes. I learned a lot from, um, you know, the good things that had happened as well. But I think the mistakes that had happened throughout that year and throughout that season um, really made me a better person in general, just knowing that I can push through those hard times and come out a better person. And I think that was probably the, the biggest takeaway from that season. Hmm. Well, what's your best moment? Best moment. Well, there's a few of them, but I think the very best moment is when you're standing at the opening ceremonies with all of your teammates, Team USA for us in general, because um, there's such a camaraderie. Everybody's just so happy to be there. And you know that you're in such good company. You're with people who have, you know, I'm with Sean White, I'm with Lindsey Vaughn, I'm with you know, this, that, and the other, I'm with these incredible athletes and we're all one team. It's not an individual when you're walking out onto the stage and you just kind of take a moment to reflect on everything that had happened for the last 17 years, you know, from when, when you first started, when you felt the drive to really push in a sport that could potentially take you to an Olympics. And, um, you also start thinking about all the sacrifices your family and your friends and yourself have made and how worth it it is at that specific moment to know that you gave it everything and it worked out. I think walking into the opening ceremonies in Pyeongchang was, um, it was an overwhelming feeling of emotion, just feeling so amazing about what you've done and what you've accomplished and um, just feeling, feeling like you're on top of the world at that point, you feel so good. Um, but that was my best moment. You know, it's, it's one of those, one of those things that for luge, especially at the Olympics, luge is one of the first sports to compete. And so there's actually a lot of luge athletes that won't go to the opening ceremonies because you compete the next day, you know, within 24 hours. And there's a lot of standing around your back gets tired, your legs get tight. And, you know, that was something that I wasn't willing to miss for almost anything because that was my, that was my moment to soak in everything that I had accomplished. What did you learn from that moment? I would say walking into the opening ceremonies and, and feeling the way that I was feeling. Um, I learned that I can do hard things. <laughs> I can overcome uh, the hurdles that life gives me. Um, and to really focus on, on your sport, the way that I was doing, um, it really took me to another level of mental stability for being an athlete because it's so difficult to even make the Olympics. But then when you get there and you know that you only get four runs to perform in front of the entire world, everybody can see it. Um, I learned, I learned specifically that I just, I'm more mentally tough than I actually thought I was. If you could go back in time, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, what advice would you give a younger you? Uh, the advice I would give myself would probably be right around the age of 11, right when I started Luge. And I would, I would really try to enforce the fact that you need to have fun because there were some years multiple years that I was doing the sport so seriously that I wasn't even having fun anymore. I was so focused on the results. I was so focused on um, trying to impress my family, my friends at home about how well I'm doing. And I lost that 
component of fun in that process that didn't make luge, you know, likable for me anymore for a little while. So that, that would be my, you know, my two cents to my 10 year old or 11 year old me is, is make sure to have fun. Cause that's really what switched from missing 2014 through the quad of 2014 to 2018 is I just, I stopped really caring about the results, but that doesn't mean that I was, you know, being lazy or not, not caring about how I did. It was go and focus on the process and do the best that you absolutely can and then let everything else fall where it may. Cause I can't control the other athletes. I can't control their equipment. I can't control the ice. I can't control anything else, but what I have, my equipment myself and um, you know, putting it down the track as clean as I can. And what age, what, at what age was it when you kind of lost a little bit the fun in it? I would say I lost the fun probably around 15, 15 years old to 17 years old Mm. because I had just started traveling, um, on the, on the U S circuit. Um, yeah, I was about 15 and I was on so many back home because I was a year round athlete. So I'd play, you know, American football and then I would go wrestle and play basketball in the winter and did luge. And then in the spring I would play soccer. And so I was missing almost all of my sports except for a little bit of soccer when I'd come back in the spring. And you know, I was missing out on that. I was missing out on my education. Um, I was missing out on my friendships that I could be making, my family time, because I was gone, you know, six to seven months out of the year just traveling and and competing. And so that was that was definitely a difficult part. And as an adolescent, you know, growing up as a teenager, trying to really establish who you are and thing, excuse me, things of that nature, it's just, that was, I don't know, I guess it was probably a harder time for me just in general in my life, as well as the sport of luge was stop wasn't being wasn't as fun as it used to be for a minute. And how did the fun return? I think the fun really started to return when when I was eighteen because I started seeing that I could really compete with some of the older kids. Um because it's it's 20 and under is is the the junior group I guess you would want to call them and then after that you move on to the senior group which is as old as anybody can be really as long as you can race so it's 20 and above and so I I was 18 I was starting to you know place in the top 10 in some of these races and I started showing like I could really compete with these guys and and that was a really good feeling and I think there was a lot going on with USA Luge and and the teams and there were just some people on my team that um that I really started to get along with because you're pretty much a family it's such a small knit group it's five or six guys four four or five girls and a doubles team so it's really like 10 people 11 people traveling around Europe for 3 months at a time you know and and you really start to become close with some of the individuals and um I I really started to become more of a family with the, with those folks. And that's, I think that's what really started help turn around uh, the fun for, for luge for me. What are the habits that make you a successful athlete and person? Oh man. Consistency is a huge thing because you could be the best athlete out there, but if you don't consistently put in the work, um, and that, that goes for a lot of things. I mean, the work could be your, your nutrition from what you're eating to the workouts you're doing to the recovery that you're doing, um, you know, and, and mental consistency too. putting yourself in a, in a mental state that you still feel good to compete and train and be in this rigorous plan, um, you know, for a four year, um, quad, it, that's a lot mentally to think about that what you start on January or February of 2015 to the Olympics, like you are working towards becoming the best in four years. And so 
I think, you know, planning is a, is a huge thing. Uh, having a solid plan with your nutrition, your diet, you know, things of that nature. So I think those are two really, really big things, but um, I think keeping it consistent is, is such a huge, huge part of making an elite athlete. And um, one thing that interests me, you are in the army and I myself have consulted to the army in terms of helping them with the physical development program to the special forces, uh, especially okay. um, the army and high performance sport. They have a lot of things in common, yeah. but on the other side, they are also different. What's your experience with that? Yeah, for me, the army training and my training for luge they they differed a lot because when i had gone to basic training which is just the initial training for the army to make sure you're fit enough can shoot a rifle those kind of things in the u.s army um the training there is very uh, endurance heavy where you know we're running three or four miles in the morning doing push-ups for two minutes and you know trying to to really give endurance for your body because when you're out on the field and you know, something happens and you have to carry somebody away or you've got to run away or whatever it is, you want to be able to have the endurance to do that. Now with luge, it's not so much endurance. It's quick, powerful, explosive movements. And um, I think when I had gone to the army in 2011, I went in there at, 195 pounds and I left after 11 weeks at 167 pounds. So I had lost a lot of my, my mass muscle, but I could run six miles, no problem, you know? And so I, I think it's, it's very interesting because there was a lot of things that really worked well for me in the army that translated over to luge But I would say that it's just very different. The army is more endurance heavy and, and USA luge and most uh, winter sports are very, um, you know, explosive, quick twitch muscle type movements. Do you have a morning routine? I do. I do. And it's something that I didn't really have until oh, I would say it was about 20, 21 years old. I wake up in the morning almost every morning at about 7 a.m. It's not super early, but it gives me enough time to, to get good rest. And when I wake up, I try to get out of bed within five to 10 minutes. I don't want to stay in bed too long because then I'll go back to bed. <laughs> And then I, I'll hop in the shower. I won't check my phone. I really try to stay off my phone in the morning for like the first hour because it just lets so much information come in right away. And I just kind of want... I want to center myself and, and figure out how I'm feeling for the day, listen to my body. And so, you know, I'll get out of bed within five to 10 minutes and I'll, and I'll go to the shower and I'll normally have a pretty hot shower, feel my body, relax, think about the day. Um, and then I'll end it with a cold, like 15 to 30 seconds of just as cold as I can take. And it just wakens me up. It just, it's like a cup of coffee, maybe five. <laughs> um, so that's what I'll normally try to do. And then right after that, I'll go downstairs and, I'll do a little bit of yoga. I'll just try to stretch out. It doesn't have to be super intense, but just to loosen my body up for the day. And then uh, I'll normally go to work and do that. But my, my morning routine is pretty set at that 7 a.m. Get out of bed pretty quick and hit the shower and then yoga. Okay. When do you check the phone for the first time? Oh, I mean, I'm not perfect on all day. Sometimes I'll wake up and I'll see my, my phone's blinking or, um, you know, I hear a message just, out of the corner of my ear, but, um, I try to wait until about eight o'clock, try to give myself a full hour of being disconnected from everything and just focusing on myself. And when I do that, um, on the days that I do it, because I'm pretty consistent with it, but sometimes, you know, my daughter who's 15 months old, will wake up at six 30 or she'll wake up at seven 45 and I got to go get her. And so, you know, sometimes things change, but eight o'clock to eight 15, just because it's nice to not have to answer to anybody or hear anything. It's just me, myself, my thoughts and, um, listening to my body. Yeah. And you want to start on your own terms, right? So not exactly reactive, much rather proactive. Exactly. I like that a lot. 
Yeah, I, I can relate to that. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> How do you prepare for important moments? Oh, I think preparing, um, depending on what it is. Like if I was, if I was thinking about luge or maybe the army or a big meeting, I think preparation is absolutely key because when it comes to those big moments, sometimes you, you can wander, you, you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but in a big moment, like at the Olympics, for uh, example, I was talking to my buddy, uh, my teammate, and he said, man, I got on the handles. I sat down on the ice and my mind just went blank and my body just took over and did it, you know, and he ended up taking second place. And he's like, I don't know if I wasn't prepared for the moment. And I was like, I think you were so prepared for this moment that you didn't have to think about doing something. Your body already knew what to do. And so for me, I really try to, you know, imagine something so vividly in that moment. So, you know, when I was at the Olympics, I had imagined myself at the Olympics and what I was going to do from start to finish on every corner so many times that when I actually got there, it wasn't so much, there wasn't so much pressure, you know, the, the crowd kind of you fled and the track. And it's just like, I already know what I'm going to go do and execute that as well as I possibly can, but it's not so much a, a huge pressure moment. Cause I think that's what a lot of athletes can feel in those big moments is, Oh, this is so much pressure. And they, they start thinking outside of the task that they have to do. And for me, especially with luge, because we don't get that many runs on a track, you know, it's not like basketball where I can go shoot a thousand layups. It's, I have five to seven runs on a track before I have to put two excellent runs together in a world cup or four runs for the Olympics. And so with us having limited amount of runs, it's very important for us to visualize it in our heads and go through it and try to make it as, you know, as in depth of a visualization as you can. So when I, when I was visualizing it, I would think, what I was wearing, how I was feeling, the air on me, the crowd, my coach, my sled, everything I could possibly think of so vividly that when I actually got in that moment, it almost clicked. It was like horse blinders were on and it was just, it was easy to do. And so I would urge people to do that in any scenario, whether it's going to talk to your boss for, you know, a promotion, or if you're presenting a thesis or a paper or some, you know, something important to you, visualize it really get it in your head and know exactly what you have to do and execute it mm. i saw in an interview you mentioned the mental strength that is developed through training and competition is often underestimated yeah um so now my question is of course you are an athlete and you train every single day most likely How would you advise someone who is not an athlete to develop that kind of mental strength? I mean, developing mental strength is, is difficult. Uh, and it took me a lot of years to do it. And maybe it's because I was younger that I didn't do it as fast, but I believe repetition and um, in-depth visualization uh, of things of that nature, that'll help at least prepare you for those moments. But having mental strength, um, rather than m mental preparedness is very different to me. And, and so the mental strength, it just comes from, I think, experience to start. Um, but before you have experience, how, how would you think to build mental strength um, is kind of complicated. <laughs> hmm. I, I, think, I think finding yourself, a, you know, a mental health coach can really help. Because there are a lot of athletes, especially, that crumble under those difficult circumstances. And it's not just because of preparedness, but it's also um, not living up to their expectation or feeling slighted. Or, um, you know, I see it all the time, especially in pro athletes, that something didn't go their way. And they have, they have a difficult time getting over that. And talking with somebody who who knows 
what they're doing with mental health is a huge um, component to, to mental strength. Cause I, I have a psychiatrist um, and, a, and a sports psychiatrist at that, that I would speak to on a weekly basis um, just to talk about how things went, how I felt about it. And it just gives you a, an honest gauge of how, how do you feel and how, how are the circumstances really? Because sometimes it's easy to get sucked into that where, you know, you want to point your finger at other people and it's, it's their fault or it's their fault. And at some point you have to take accountability for, for your actions, but being able to do that with a mental health coach, a psychiatrist, a sports psychiatrist, um, I think that'll help you build that, that mental strength. And then the work with the psychiatrist that you are doing is mainly the outside perspective that helps you? Yeah, I think just having somebody else who, who can kind of break down the scenario that, that you're having trouble with um, and someone that you can confide in that is, is, isn't going to take it personally. Because there were times that I was absolutely furious with my, my performance, with how I was doing, um, you know, where I was in the world. I was missing my family, my, my wife, my, you know, whatever it was. And there were some times that I was just so fired up and he's just like, okay, let's bring it down, take some breaths and just talk about what is actually going on. Because it's so easy to have so much negativity. Negativity just feeds especially when you're on the road and you only have your 10 teammates and you know, you're in eight hours ahead of your wife. So you can't call her cause it's, you know, two or three in the morning for them. And so having somebody that you can talk to that can really break down the situation and give you direction of how to correct how you're feeling can be, I mean, a huge, huge component of that mental strength. Mm, I believe that. Who's your role model and why? Um, you know, I have two role models and my first one's a sports role model and his name's Michael Johnson. He ran the 200 and the 400 at the Atlanta 1996 games world record for a very long time. I had a huge poster of him in my room and his gold shoes. And, um, man, I, I, I was five years old at that point, just turned five and I watched the Olympics and I saw him run it. And I looked at my mom and I was like, I want to be that guy. And she's like, really? And I was like, yeah, I want to be him. She's like, okay. And so from then on, at a very young age, I knew that I wanted to go to the Olympics. I didn't know how I was going to get there. But I had started running track. I had stopped eating fatty foods. Like my nutrition was just through the roof for a, a five-year-old. Um, you know, my mom would bring home like a donut or cookies And I would ask my mom, like, does Michael Johnson eat this? She's like, no. And I'd take it and I'd slide it down to my little brother and be like, you can eat it. It's not for me. I didn't like milk. I saw him on a Got Milk commercial. I was like, mom, I need milk. Like, I wasn't even thirsty. I just need milk. Because I just, I just wanted to emulate him as, as best as I could. And um, so he was my sports role model. And then my dad is my role model um, as a normal person, I guess you could say. <laughs> but he's just super dedicated. He's always had my back. Um, he's always done the best for his family. And, um, you know, he's somebody that I look up to every day and still think, man, I wish I could be that guy. So mm, nice. Your sport luge. Yeah. It seems to be very European dominated. If you look uh, throughout history, why do you think yep. it is? Uh, I mean, luge is very European dominated, Uh, mainly because they got a head start on us. <laughs> they started, you know, uh, 20, 30 years before us. And, and in reality, they, they just have access to more tracks. And um, since it is a European sport, just in general, um, they, have, they have more funding for for their organizations, especially Germany. I know Germany just has a ridiculous budget for their research and development. And they have four different tracks within Germany that are, you know, only eight hours apart. And for us in North America, I'll even speak for the Canadians. Um, we only have four tracks in North America and, you know, they're on opposite sides of, of the continent. So 
it's, it's difficult for us to test different things, different items that we're trying to pursue on our sleds for the technological factors when, you know, we have to fly back and forth into all these different tracks because every track is different and um, being able to, to have a set of steels or runners, things that are in contact with the ice uh, for every single track would be super difficult for us in North America. But uh, you know, the Germans, they, and Austrians and Italians, I mean, all the, all the European um, organizations, they all just have easy access to those things. And so I think that's really where um, they beat us on the techno and the technology side. And then since they do have so many tracks, they have a lot of mini organizations at those tracks. And so they're starting to bring up these kids sliding on the tracks at six to eight years old, you know, and I didn't even know about luge until I was 10 or 11. And that's when I started. And so they already have a five to six year head start of knowing what they're doing on the sled before I even hopped on a sled. What is the best advice you received and who gave it to you? Oh, I've, I feel like I've received a lot of really good advice, but um, I think the best advice I ever got was from my grandfather on my mom's side. And he said, oh, who you are. and I know that's really sports specific, um, but it really, it really rang true for me because there was a lot of times that it would have been easy to get caught up in being a, an elite athlete or, um, using that as a status of, of something, but remembering who I was, my family and my friends, my community at home, and just remembering that I'm still me. I'm just doing awesome things. <laughs> so I think that that was the best advice my, my grandfather gave me and, and possibly just anybody in general was just always remember who you are. Hmm. How does a typical training day look like? Oh, when I was, when I was competing, because I'm not competing anymore. When I was competing, it was, it was a pretty strict schedule. You know, I'd wake up at seven. I'd, I'd have a little bit of food, like maybe some toast and a banana before going and warming up in the gym. And I'd hit the gym for, from nine to 11, pretty much. Um, and that the training differs, you know, depending on whether you're, you're sliding season or if you're on the off season where you're really trying to build up your muscle your, um, you know, your explosive strength and your quick twitch muscles type, um, things. But for the summer, you'd wake up, you'd eat, you'd go to the gym, um, you'd hit your workout and then you'd go have a little bit of lunch and recovery. And then for luge, we'd go do sports specific, uh, workouts, which is working on our paddles, working on our, um, compression is what we call it. But with luge, you have these two handles on the side and you push yourself back as far as you can. And so you're really putting yourself kind of like a suitcase, you're just closing it and opening it up as fast as you can. So, um, you know, we'd work on things like that. And then we also had an indoor start facility and that start facility had three different levels of ramps that would mimic different start ramps around the world. And so we kind of had access to a, a really great facility in that sense. And so we'd go do that for, um, you know, an hour and a half or two hours and then it'd be dinner time. And for me at that point, I'm, I was doing school. So, It was pretty much a full day every day. Hmm. I read in an interview or in, in a profile, you train 50 to 60 hours a week. Yeah, it was, it was pretty close to that, actually. I mean, given there were some differences depending on the season, but, you know, especially when you're in season for, for luge and you're competing, you know, you're, I would say that my, my training day starts right as I start eating because my nutrition is part of my, my training. And then you go to the track and, you know, it takes you 15 minutes to get to the track. You're warming up for 30 minutes before you, your three runs or two runs that day. You, you have an hour and a half of sliding. You'd come back, you'd eat, and then you'd go to the gym. Um, you know, and so those days were really roughly 10, 10 hour, eight to 10 hour days that, um, Some of them were even longer than that, 10 to 12 hour days that you're putting in. Mm. Okay. Bonus question. Ex actually, sure. two questions. You have an agency for digital marketing that is specialized on attorneys. 
it is. Why or how did you get interested and the expertise in digital marketing and why attorneys? Well, first, I, I got interested in, in digital marketing um, because I'm, very, I'm pretty tech savvy in general, but I mainly just wanted to start something for myself. I think digital marketing was an easier route for me to start something myself. Um, and coming from so many years of competing and never really having a job that when I came back and I got a job, I hated it. I hated working for somebody else because the harder I worked, it didn't matter. It just looked good, you know, and I wanted to be rewarded for how hard I worked. And so when it came down to it, I said, I can't be anybody else's employee. I've got to be my own boss. I've got to figure out how to do this. And so I have a couple of friends that, that do digital marketing. I asked them, you know, a few questions. They gave me a book. They said, here, read this. If you have any questions, let us know. And off it went. And so digital marketing has been uh, my, my main source of income for nine months now since I had started. And I picked attorneys because uh, in my family, I have three different attorneys. Uh, my grandpa on my dad's side, my dad and his brother uh, are, are all attorneys. And so I, I kind of understand their language, their needs, their wants, their pain points. Um, and I just, I know that attorneys seem like they don't really need much help because they're making good money. People are coming in and out, but there's a lot of them that when you're not in a big organization that has a whole lot of marketing budget, um, that they struggle to make it off the ground. And I felt that attorneys were very underserviced in that sense of how can I help them create a bigger firm, a bigger business for themselves. And, um, you know, and I had seen it in my own life with my family that sometimes it's hard to find enough clientele to keep the doors open, let alone pay for your bills, food for the kids, things of that nature. And so I kind of took it upon myself that those were, those are the people I wanted to take care of. Hmm. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? I was thinking about that, Christian, and I, I don't have anybody off the top of my head, but I would really like to because I think it's, it's really interesting for somebody to share their entire story in a condensed, in a condensed version. Um, so off the top of my head, I don't, but I will get you somebody. We can ask Michael Johnson. Oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> that would be really awesome. Oh, that would be epic. I would definitely be in on that. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people find you? Uh, so you can find me on Instagram. It's T Morris 91. And then Facebook, if you want to look me up, I, I don't really go on there much except to keep my grandma updated on <laughs> how old my kid's getting. <laughs> so my Facebook's pretty dead, but my Instagram handle is T Morris 91. Okay, cool. Thank you for your time. Thank you very that much. Christian. Really awesome. Thank Thanks, you. man. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Thank you.